Today is April 12th, 2024, and you have found the Living Youth Podcast. My name is John Robinson. I'm here again with my co-host, Mr. Wallace Smith. Mr. Smith, spring has returned, and I am happy. Oh, I am delighted. The weather is wonderful outside. I've got a nice mug with a little bit of my coffee left in it. I'm, I'm, I'm good to go. You took a bit of a journey to get out and see the eclipse. Was it worth it? And do you have anything that inspired you? I, you know, Mr. Robinson, why don't we make our podcast today about lessons from the eclipse? What an incredible idea. It's almost like we thought about this ahead of time. <laughs> uh, that's what we're doing today. All right. Sounds good. Welcome back, and you have indeed found the Living Youth Podcast. I hope you did that on purpose. Even if you didn't, we're still glad you're here. I did go see the eclipse recently, and maybe you're tired of hearing it. I hope not. It's pretty cool. You won't get to hear about another one, at least in the U.S., until 2044. Um, but yeah, I did have some thoughts. Mr. Robinson, I know you did not see this eclipse in particular. I don't even, did you even go outside and see any of the partial stuff going on here in Charlotte? Yes, we went out, we went outside and, um, you know, last year when I was in Texas, there was an eclipse that went through and it was just a coincidence that I was there and it was very similar because it was not a complete one. And right. it was like, that one last year seemed a bit darker where, where, however it hit here in Charlotte. Um, and I have heard other people say something similar. It was a little disappointing in terms of the overall darkness that it got, but you can definitely tell that the lights dimmed for sure. Uh, last year when I was in Texas, I was struck by how it actually made things cooler, which mm. blocked the sun, go figure, right? But right. Um, we we could have driven down to Texas this year because it went right over my mom's place there ah. in East Texas, and uh, I was tempted, but that is a 14-hour trip, and I that's a lot. I'll wait for the 2044 one. <laughs> <laughs> well, the one last year was an annular eclipse. <clears throat> so the moon's a little closer. And so you have more of a ring around the sun. But just looking at it, actually, yeah, the when it actually hit annular would have been around, uh, yeah, kind of southern and western Texas. But out where you guys would have been still would have been quite a bit of quite a bit of coverage. Um, I'm not sure how much it would have been actually for the um uh, yeah, for, for the one that happened just this past, this past weekend, we did drive to Ohio and we went with the De Simone family and we spent, um, uh, which was Sunday night, we left Sunday morning and went to Ohio and spent Sunday night with the falls, Brian and Stephanie fall there in the area. They put us up, we kind of, kind of lay, they fed us food and everything Sunday night. But the plan was to actually go, go actually just drive straight to Either well at first Cleveland we were thinking, but then looking at the very detailed weather forecast, thought that perhaps Sandusky might be kind of hedge our our probabilities a little better. <clears throat> so we ended up going to Sandusky, and what we did not know as we were watching the eclipse in Sandusky was that Mr. Senna was actually in the same city. He and his family had actually gone also. And, a and a just friend of the look. podcast. A was friend of the podcast actually. In the was, same city. That's watching, right. Yeah. So anyway, if we'd known that, we might have. Uh, it would have been fun being in the same parking lot, I guess. But anyway, so we were there at a parking lot and, uh, we took the, the falls kiddos along with us, which was really neat. Nice. And yeah, it was a, it was a good time. We really enjoyed it. We, we also saw, now you did see the one back in 2017, I think, right? That was, uh, you had the chance to see that one? No. Oh, you didn't. Mm -hmm. Oh, well we, we had seen the 2017 eclipse. I think, oh, we drove down to South Carolina somewhere to see that one. And, and that also was really worthwhile. This one I was really, really hoping would work because that one was perfect. That was a beautiful, clear sky. But I, I had actually advised my two older sons who were just starting their college semesters to not come. That they should really. And it's kind of that's kind of the opposite advice I would normally give. And in that case, I do think in that case, I kind of at least for our kids, our family, their specific situation, that was really bad advice. So I remember as I was enjoying the eclipse that year, 2017, I was profoundly realizing, oh, I should have told them to come. And plus a lot of their fellow students are probably coming anyway. Uh, at least advise them that way. They're adults. They can make their own choices. Whereas this time, even when I prayed about it, because there, one of the things I'll kind of comment is eclipses remind you of how much in the world you don't have control over. And so the weather, we've been praying about it leading up to that. But it's specifically, I remember sometimes in my prayer saying or asking God that hey, even if the rest of us miss the eclipse, please help 
you know, Jonathan and Michael see it because I still felt bad for the advice I gave them that they dutifully followed back then. And uh, anyway, so we all did get to see it. It was a it was a great experience. Really, really enjoyed the trip overall. The whole whole shebang. Really, really liked it. So, Mr. Smith, for somebody like me who who felt the penumbra of the eclipse, <laughs> um, tell me what it was like to actually be there where you had the the full coverage. Did it get completely dark? Were there any other? I had somebody show me a picture, and um, I thought it was fascinating because it kind of created a sunset on the horizons, but in like a, in a total total 360, yeah. which would never happen, which is kind of pretty cool. It is pretty what cool. Did, what did you observe, and what was it like to actually be there with the full coverage of the moon over the sun? And also, what an incredible cosmic coincidence that the moon is exactly the <laughs> right size that it can perfectly cover up the sun. Yeah, well, we will, we will get to that. Again, what's the whole theme of our podcast, Teens and Young Adults, say it with us. It is learning how to think Biblically, So we'll definitely uh, start attaching those thoughts to this in a moment. But in terms of the actual experience, it was really neat. Uh, we, we parked near a mall, so we'd have something that we got there early. So we'd have something to do, kind of walk around and, and, and spend time together leading up to the actual event. And then we were outside for about an hour or two ahead of time. And we've got the glasses. You don't want definitely, hey, kids, don't look at the sun unless you've got protection. It's, uh, it's definitely, even at the last moment, it is amazing, astonishing how bright it is until mm-hmm. the sun is fully covered. Uh, the sun, go figure, is really bright. So anyway, we were using the glasses to watch the disk of the moon increasingly cover the sun. And actually, that in itself is fascinating. I think uh, Jonathan put it this way. It's like, you know, you yeah, you see the sun and the moon, and you know they're in space, and you know they're objects in space, but there's something about seeing them interact in a certain way that makes the reality of this three-dimensional object in space, it's, it, just, it, it does kind of become more real. But as it's happening, if you're not looking at the sun, you're just looking around you, there's this kind of interesting dimming over time. I wouldn't, darkening could be the word, but for some reason dimming comes to mind. And my wife nailed it, what was weird about it. Among the things that were strange, uh, for instance, I thought there's kind of things took on to me in my mind. And I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a graphics artist, Mr. Robinson, like some of you guys. But I would say things started to take kind of a metallic hue. Mm-hmm. But what my wife noticed, and, and I thought this was a great way to put it, that unlike an overcast day, you know, overcast days make it dim. But unlike an overcast day, the light was not diffused. So you look at your shadows and your shadows are still as sharp as ever, just like they normally would be in the full sun, mm-hmm. but yet it's still dimmer. And so that that was a very unusual experience. The temperature began to drop. It's, at first, you're, you're not really sure the temperature is dropping because it's, it's a relatively cool day. But then after a while, you do start to notice, yeah, it really truly is cooler. And then you're watching through the glasses at the last minute, uh, you you see suddenly the light disappear because those glasses are really dark. In fact, you just don't see anything other than the sun. I've tried to shine a flashlight through them, and unless it's actually the sun, you just don't see anything. So sure enough, at the la- finally it goes totally dark in the glasses. You throw the glasses off, and it really is, and it happens kind of fast. In fact, before before it was totality, but it was getting very close. You're seconds away because I, I had a timer on my computer. Of course, I did, and uh, I would I would look away from the sun and take the glasses off, and the darkness really started to accelerate. Like suddenly, it was getting darker much faster. But once the totality hit, uh, we took off the glasses, and it really was remarkable it was i could say it was like nighttime at the same time we were under the street lights started to come on in the parking lot so it was a little hard to tell and just like you said uh, 360 degrees around us was this evening color it's as if sunset is going on everywhere you look on the horizon and i would say compared to 2017 it wasn't quite as deeply red a sunset mm-hmm. and yet at the same time it really was like that and yet the sky is dark and where the sun is there's this hole in fact while the sky was dark and we could see some planets, like you could see Venus, uh, you could see some of the, the, the stars in that sense. It, it, was, it was a dark sky, but actually where the moon was blocking the sun was the absolute darkest. In fact, it's like everything else is kind of a deep, 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 dark blue. But there where the moon's in front of the sun, it is just black, like an inky blackness. And what you could see around then is what's normally invisible, which would have been the corona which is uh, these, it's the upper outer atmosphere of the sun, which believe it or not is hotter than the sun. Mm-hmm. The sun itself is somewhere around 10,000 degrees, the surface of the sun around 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. 
the corona they've measured at like two million degrees Fahrenheit. Like it is just a, and that's actually a mystery. They don't completely understand why that might be. I have my own personal theory, but I'm not a physicist. Uh, so they they've got ideas, but they don't they don't really know necessarily. So it's it's just really hot. But what was fascinating this time, which I did not see in 2017, was we saw these red things here and there, red bumps, you know, around the the the, the rim there of the of the moon shadow. And we, we knew right afterwards because uh, everyone was asking about them because my son was Googling and there were no answers, but you could tell on Google that everybody was asking about it and kind of find out, at least Scientific American put out something a little bit later, that those were solar prominences. If you ever watch a science show about the sun, you know that sometimes the plasma can eject from the sun and mm-hmm. form a loop mm-hmm. or some kind of a fountain of such, of, of sorts. And that's what those were. And so you're actually seeing, in fact, if your eye could really resolve it as finally, you actually, one of them would have, you would have seen a loop. My wife took pictures and you can see them on, on her pictures, but because there was a very thin cloud right in front, her pictures could not completely mm-hmm. focus, but even manually focused, the cloud was just like a touch of haze. But in terms of, of naked eye, you could see it remarkably well. So it was, it was a beautiful experience. It lasted for more, not quite four minutes, but a, a good long three plus minutes. And uh, the birds started acting goofy. When we saw it in 2017, some birds in the trees started singing like it was nighttime. We didn't hear, at least I didn't hear uh, anything like that. I heard people honking their horns, but you did see the birds start to freak out a little bit. I, I kind of imagine that they're birds, that their brains just told them, hey, it's it's nighttime. I was supposed to be back feeding the kids or whatever it is it's supposed mm-hmm. to be. Uh, and so a lot of them started flying and fluttering uh, the moment it hit. And then almost four minutes later, not quite, it was it was all over. Wow. And, and and then you, you could tell because the diamond ring effect started to happen as the sun just started to peak, you know, as the moon just barely got out of the way. And it, it's only fractions of a second and you just can't look at it anymore because the sun, it, it doesn't take much of the sun to just, it, it, actually this is one of the lessons I planned, but it does kind of remind me when Moses asked to look at God's face, the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ, and he said, yeah, you can't look at me and live, but I'll put you in this crevice and I'll kind of cover your face and you can see my back. And that's kind of like just the merest peak of the sun and you can't, you, you know, you, you got to turn away. You can't look at it anymore. And so kind of that, that's, that's a bonus lesson. That's not one of the ones I had in mind for this, but uh, it kind of reminded me of, of that. Well, that shows you what a amateur uh, eclipse person I am because I didn't know that you took off your glasses when it's during the full eclipse. I thought you had to wear the glasses. Oh, the whole during time. totality? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You'd, now, if it were an annular eclipse where the sun isn't completely covered, you, I, I don't think in that case you can. I think because there's still too much of the sun that's actually showing. But yeah, during totality, uh, when it's a total eclipse, you, you, do, you can remove your glasses okay. and see the whole interesting. thing. Interesting. So, what other deeper lessons did you? All come right. Away with? Well, I would, I will, I will appreciate your feedback on these, Mr. Robinson. So, we're all about thinking biblically. And that's what, that's what our hope for you on this podcast is, is not only you get to hear what our conversations are like in terms of when we're talking about things, but when we're talking about things that are informed by a biblical worldview and biblical thinking. And so you cannot help but, but think, especially with something like this, to think about them with biblical thoughts. So I, I have three. Two of them are kind of related, but there's three that I, I came up with for the podcast here. Uh, one involves uh, a sense of awe, as in A W E, awe. You know, awe is very important. The Bible talks about God being awesome, and and uh, the old King James word word for that that you'll see. The New King James often uses awesome there. The old King James says uh, terrible, and I actually kind of prefer the old King James in a sense because of how we kind of take awesome for granted. Mm-hmm. Because terrible started to take on a negative connotation. And so we tend to talk about something being awesome so it doesn't always have that negative. And yet it kind of needs part of the negative because sometimes that which is awe-inspiring is also terrifying. And those things really are related. Uh, I I just read a book on awe by this fellow. uh, I had to apologize to him if I say his name wrong. But uh, Doc Dotcher or Datcher, I'm Mm. really not sure I said his first name, but his last name is Keltner. And he's a psychologist with UC Berkeley. And he wrote a book on awe based on his research because he had realized that awe was, uh, it's an emotion, it's something you feel, but it, it just had, 
it didn't have that much research poured into it like some other emotions have, like anger or joy. And so he researched on awe, and one of his first steps was trying to define it. You have to define something to study it. So he defined awe for the sake of his research this way. Uh, quoting him, he says, awe is the feeling of being in the presence of something vast that transcends your current understanding of the world. And in this sense, vast doesn't have to be physically large. It can be like the Grand Canyon is vast and that does almost really overwhelm you. But it doesn't ha it has to be vast in some sort of scope or, or scale. A music, for instance, mm -hmm. you can listen to and suddenly you just feel like you're in the presence of something large, right? Well, those European cathedrals that they built were built on a scale to make you feel awe when you come into them. Cause you, you feel very small compared to the, the scope of the cathedral. Yeah. And you know, that's exactly right. I remember being told about that when we went to uh, Rome and the Vatican, well, not the Vatican, uh, what's the Basilica St. As it's called mm -hmm. St. Peter's Basilica at a hundred percent, when they explained to us that Roman emperors like to have that kind of background, a large setting because they wanted you to feel small in their presence. And then we actually went to the Basilica there in Rome, and sure enough, it's built on the same kind of principles as the Roman, and they wanted you to feel mm. small, but not necessarily in a negative way, because to, to, to realize that the things you're trying to be in touch with are larger than you. And I would say that was even the statues of their so-called saints, right, or the apostles, whatever the case is, their popes were larger than life, and it did make you feel small, and it was humbling. And so a lot of things can inspire awe, and that that's what something like this does. It just moves. It, it's interesting because part of his definition says uh, the presence of being in the presence of something vast that transcends your current understanding of the world. Part of what I appreciate about the eclipse was even though I, I mean, oh, most mankind knows the science behind it now, right? We know the moon orbits at a certain cycle. We know that every once in a while it happens to get in the presence of the sun. Uh, get in the way of the sun so you're in the, the, the moon's shadow and yet you still feel a sense of awe because even though you have you know what's going on it's like it's not a mystery it's it's the moon right it orbits the earth and it's now it's in the presence of the, and yet the experience of it can inspire a sense of awe because you are reminded that there is something large in the universe that you even the fact that we couldn't control it the fact that we 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 had to if we wanted good weather we had to pray. That's the only thing we could do to make sure we were in the presence of that. And we kept coming back to this idea of what if we were an ancient people who didn't have the internet, didn't have an email from your buddy, didn't even have access to, say, some of the ancient astronomers who were watching the sky. Like the Assyrians, they had multiple royal astronomers that were constantly watching the sky and to, to not only probably to interpret things in an occult kind of way, but frankly, you have to keep track of the times, right? And that, that's what they had. So if you don't have anything like that, and you're just some farmer, or you're working your cattle, whatever the case might be, and you notice around you it's getting oddly dim, it's unnerving a little bit. The fact that we knew there was an eclipse going on made it less unnerving, but you did start to notice it's a little dimmer, it's a little cooler, but you're looking up at the sun, and of course you don't stare at the sun because ancient man knew like we did, don't look at it. But still you just glance up, and you wouldn't notice anything. That actually was neat. Uh, kids, we don't recommend looking at the sun. At the same time, during the partial eclipse, during the partial, if you just kind of glance around the sun, if you're doing your best, you don't want to burn your eyes, you wouldn't notice anything because the sun is still super bright. Mm -hmm. You just wouldn't notice anything until totality. You know, to support your contention, because I have thought about that. We take for, we really take for, gra for granted our scientific knowledge that we've accumulated. Yeah. And there's a lot of stuff that we know really was sort of um, somewhere between uh, I think my brain is not calling up all the right words. <laughs> um, you, you know, uh, superstition and all these different things. And, and, you know, what, what, what is so much of our draw being drawn to idolatry and then the, the sacrifices we make to pagan idols was an attempt to feel like we had some control over, mm. over the creation, but to, to support your contention, I remember this from my history podcast um, a couple summers ago. There is, it's alternately called the Battle of the Eclipse or the Battle, Battle of Halys or Halys, hmm. fought in the 6th century BC, and a, a full-blown eclipse occurred during the battle. They stopped the battle, and they negotiated a peace because wow. everybody was so 
I don't know if the word traumatized is right, but clearly it had a major <laughs> impact on them. And uh, because you don't know that would, if you have no idea really what's going on out there, you know, like we, like you said, again, we take for granted that we know the moon cycles, which by the way, one of the ways, you know, if um, an ancient um, civilization of any sorts, if you could figure out what their astrology was, if they knew the moon cycle, they were an advanced one. Really? It's really it's it's difficult to figure out because you have to be in it for 19 years. You you have to track it for 19 years and then you find what this it is. The moon is very the, the moon seems to have a mind of its own until you realize it's a whole 19 year cycle. Mm. That, that, so um, but anyway, you know, when you don't know any of that, it would seem it really would seem like the gods had had done something dramatic that they turned because to them it's just turning day into night. Right. And. It hit us too that, I mean, we saw these two because we literally traveled to them. And there's this narrow band across the country where you could see it. Most people wouldn't even see them when they come up regularly, right? If they come up every 20 years, you know, ish or so, you still wouldn't see it unless you happen to be in the right place at the right time. And when you did, and you noticed suddenly it was night in the middle of the day and you looked up at the sun and you saw a gaping black hole. It just, it's almost as if kids, the earth is not flat, but if the earth were flat and there were a dome, that looks like a hole has been punched through it. Every, where you saw the sun every day of your life and your father saw it and your grandfather saw it, what you're now seeing is this gaping black, inky black, dark hole. And that would have been Mm -hmm. astonishing yep. i mean just think of how that would have freaked people out at that time so then i have an on the fly question for you sure. spontaneous questioning all right speaking of the of a flat earth concept would an eclipse and then it, it, it creating this 360 360 degree sunset view would that would that in any way indicate see that's yet another proof that the earth is not flat okay that's a really good question uh i could say uh, that and by the way I'm not saying this is my expertise. I'm just reasoning through this. Uh, if you imagine as, as flat earthers do a certain model where you've got, uh, I can't, it's hard to say because uh, their models are so wrong, so fundamentally wrong that it's hard to even, where do you start about how wrong they are? But if you at least assume that the sun in the sky is round, which their model, it can't be because people would have different views of that and they don't. Everyone has the same view of the sun. And you assume that the, the moon is round. And you assume the moon can eventually get between the the sun above the disk, the flat earth, and the ground, then yeah, you could still have an eclipse. But what would be different, like if you look at a map of where the eclipse totality occurs at any given moment, in like a lot of this map, if you look at the U.S. map where this where this occurred, you'll see a lot of the spots are oblong. They're not perfectly circular. That's because if it's a flat earth where even if the, the moon is, is at an angle compared, uh, compared to the sun above it, you'd still see, like if you take a basketball, no matter where you are in the room, if you shine a light on that to make a shadow, it's going to be a round shadow, mm -hmm. but the, a curved earth, that round shadow falling along it is going to be misshapen depending upon the angle. And so now you might say, well, you can't trust NASA. That's what many of them would say. You can't trust NASA. Well, what you can do is trust that you are looking at it and you look at your clock. And if you're within that space, it happens exactly like they said. And therefore it is an oblong. It's not a normal circular shape. And how do you actually explain that? Well, since light can't work normally for them anyway, I have no idea how they would. But I guarantee if they're really caught up in that, they will have some kind of explanation. Okay. Okay. So back to your, your point, you know, you were you were going through this need for awe. And, and I so I have two questions. for. Well, I have a comment and a question. Okay. It immediately reminded me of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Because so much of what transpires of, of the many things God is, God is trying to accomplish by taking the world through the, through, through the day of the Lord. One of them is an, an inescapable awe at God's power because, right. because we've convinced, we've convinced ourselves in our day and age that with our technology, we can solve any problems. There's large groups of people that don't even believe there's a God. Many of us act as if we don't believe that there's a God. And so part of what God is going to do with the, the day of the Lord is <laughs> put us in a, in a, a 
in awe of what right. he's capable of doing. Right. And you know, when Hollywood can depict the most amazing things with CG these days, CG uh, computer graphics, and they can and depict anything. And how many times has New York and the White House been blown <laughs> up and f- giant floods? And then yeah. even, even um, one of the sex, Zack Snyder ones where he's trying to do his own Star Wars, which isn't going very well, but these big epic, you know, planet scenes because i've seen the trailer so my question to you is is there a connection between awe and awesome and terrible and and a fear of god yes i would say that boy that could be a an entirely other conversation but yes there is it's a the the terror in terms of the sense of being terrified Mm -hmm. and awe in terms of the sense of feeling overwhelmed. I I remember trying to describe it like a circle, like they, um, like things and experience can be so extreme that, that the response to being terrified and the response to being overwhelmed, that they're essentially the same. I know in his book on awe, Keltner tries to, um, separate out terror. Uh, Biblically though, when you see a lot of the discussion, it, it tends to speak of them like you can experience and think Mr. Weston even said this in a sermon recently, but you can experience the fear of God in a good way, but mm-hmm. also in a bad way yeah, that yep, those things yep. are compared. I, uh, they're not, they're not unrelated. I've thought about that a lot. And I think actually a father and children is really one of the best analogies I can think of, which is, you know, I thought about my girls. Um, they do not fear me. Like they are not concerned. They're, they're not, not afraid of you. Yeah. They're not afraid of me. They're not concerned that their health is going to be damaged by me. In fact, they know that I'm very invested in protecting them. But when they were little kids and they would do something wrong, um, you feared dad when he rose up to settle things, you know, to right. take, take care of things. And, and, and also I think a, a good one is they, f- they fear to displease me. Like if you've done a good job as a parent, um, and maybe you could say I'm taking fear too far, but like your kids, if you've done a good job and they look up at you with awe and respect, they really do respect you. They're, they're, I, I believe fear, an element of fear is the right way of looking at it. Like uh, emotions can be mixed, right? But you don't, there's just this little fear built in that you've really disappointed your parents in, 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 in some way. Like you've done something that they're disappointed in with you. So maybe you could say, well, that's just a disappointment, I suppose. But I mean. Well, no, it, no, I, I think you're right. It, it's the awe of God is rooted in also a profound respect in that he, he, he is so great that the idea of, of either that he is incredibly pleased with you or that he is incredibly angry with you, they move you at your core, right? The most fundamental parts of you. And, and you're not talking about fear as in afraid, like your, your kids are afraid. In fact, it's, it's interesting. If you, if you're, 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 if your children respect you, then like you mentioned earlier, you, they know you're looking out for their health, that you care about that. But that's kind of the same thing even with God, even when he punishes. There is also the fact that he is looking out for mankind. And there is a certain kind of fear because uh, Abraham Lincoln sort of said it that I, I can't, I didn't have the quote at hand, but essentially, or maybe it was Jefferson. It's kind of weird because Jefferson's a little weirder, but how this idea that God is patient, but it only goes so far Mm -hmm. because he actually loves mankind enough to be managing the outcome of all of this. And that might mean the worst of consequences in some cases. You know, I've been reading through because in my world, the new Testament apparently doesn't exist. And I just spend all my time (laughs) reading reading the old Testament, but I've, I'm almost finished reading all the way through the first and second Kings. And man, I, I would have pulled the plug on Israel about a hundred years earlier than God did. Wow. Like like his, his, his truly his patience and his willingness to help them at times just blows my mind because Mm. they so didn't deserve it. Sometimes, And I think, and I really do try to personalize that in my life. Um, but he, he, God, God, man, he gives us a lot of room and he's very patient with us and he loves us. And he's just, there's always this, I don't want to be, I don't want to characterize God's emotions on this too, and with too fine of a point beyond what's mm. recorded in the Bible. But you get this sense that there's always this like really deep hope that maybe they'll turn it around, you know, and, and you do, you would occasionally like you, I was read through Hezekiah's reforms. I mean, they did get a King who at the end was, I mean, just that was the, if they had two golden ages, that was it. Solomon's time mm. and Hezekiah because he restored proper worship. But even right. then, you know, it's interesting. He didn't live very long. He took the throne at twenty five and reigned twenty nine years, so he died in his fifties. And I, I don't know a lot of the a lot of the kings did not live to seventy. Only, right. only David and Solomon, near as I can tell. Oh, maybe Saul. 
Anyway, sorry, I'm taking off the podcast. In no, no, right? that's all right. It's it, all this does speak to the fact that God, it, it should. Oh boy, how, how does Paul say that we? Oh, I didn't think of this verse either. But how we uh, we work out our salvation with trembling yeah, and fear. Yeah. Uh, this idea that God is involved with us, like He was involved with the kings and involves with Israel, that it does actually bring a trembling and fear. But it's not the same kind of fear of someone that you're actually scared of as a bad actor, and yet it is something that moves you profoundly. That's part of why I do like the old King James usage, like in the two verses I, I thought of for this. Philippians 2.12, by the way. Oh, that one? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Right. And so that's why I like Job 37, 22, the way it words it in the old King James, it says, with God is terrible majesty. And mm-hmm. I like the use of the mm-hmm. word terrible there. It's like, uh, I'm going to send all fancy now, uh, but the, the poet W.B. Yeats, how in his uh, poem Easter 1916, where he's talking about this uh, Irish uprising, and he repeats throughout it, it's just such a powerful line where he says... Uh, uh, all changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. Mm. What a what a weird juxtaposition of the word terrible and beauty. But he he means it to to evoke that kind of power. Uh, Psalm sixty three and verse sorry sixty six and verse three in the Old King James says similarly, say unto God, how terrible art thou in thy works. Through the greatness of thy power shall thine enemies submit themselves unto thee. Mm-hmm. It's, it's the kind of an eclipse is the kind of thing that makes you want to talk like the old King James. You right. want to start using these and thous yeah. because you're reminded of how of how great how great God is. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I guess you know this this making me think about ancient Israel. Really, a fundamental problems of theirs, especially Israel, but eventually extended into Judah because they all went into captivity was it was a failure to have a proper awe and fear and reverence mm. of God that led them to their disobedience because they saw the Assyrians or they saw the Babylonians and feared them more than they feared God. And really God was just far more fear, fearsome than the Assyrians and, and proved it, you yeah. know, at times. Yeah. And so, uh, having the proper awe, awe reverence, I like I like that you brought in terrible I like terrible majesty I think that's actually a oh fantastic I love it that's uh, you know I, if I was gonna start a band maybe that would be terrible our title majesty. or at least our first <laughs> album but I, oh, I really like that you know tied to what you're saying it, I didn't think of it until you mentioned it is this idea that Israel started to see them as God without that kind of terrible majesty I feel that this is imagined I can't say this is indeed what's happening but when you recognize you're dependent on God for your crops right for the health yes. of your crops. Yes. But after a while, especially with superstitions, the, it's not so much that you realize your dependency on God, but the God becomes a tool for mm-hmm. you to invoke, to, to try to get your crops good or try to, and you forget, no, the reason you're going to God is because you are nothing and he is everything yep. and he controls every, you are not in control and you want your family to be able to eat. So you're going to the one who is in control. And that was another thing that's related to this is the eclipse, even in the stuff we couldn't control. We couldn't control the clouds. We couldn't control the weather. We certainly didn't make the moon do this. You are so not in control yeah. of most of the things around you. And and that is also kind of an awesome thing to understand. That's what I learned at Adventure Camp, the, the one year in particular in Yellowstone. Um, you know, we, we go into the office and they make you watch a video if you're gonna do the backcountry hiking. And they're like, my joke was, it shouldn't be called Yellowstone Park. It should be called 101 Ways to Die. Because <laughs> everything was dead. And it had boiling hot geysers. It don't, don't, in fact, you could get closer to the bears than you could get to the wolves. Like, wow. stay 100 yards away from the wolves and this whole thing. And, and so, okay, you, you know, you get it. And, and I like to think I really did have a genuine faith that God would protect us. But, like, the second, second or third day, we were hiking, and there was just a storm with lightning around us. And you do not realize how vulnerable and small you are until you're in the wilderness with a storm with lightning around you. We have this false sense of security around us in our normal lives because, well, if it's storming outside, we just go into our house. Uh, if somebody's threatening you, you call the police. We, we have this, this um, real fault. Uh, like, there is some true security. Don't get me wrong. But it's kind of a false sense of security because all of those things can collapse. Right. You know, the police couldn't come that time. Um, you were standing on your porch and lightning hit. A tree fell on you, right? We're, we're not as in, in control as we think we are. Right. And, and being out in Yellowstone in in awe of God's uh, creation and the lightning, you were like, 
God, please, <laughs> please, like, please protect us. Well, because I, I felt the responsibility of leading the the hiking group, and you know, if something bad happens, you feel like that's on you. I was yeah. I was not concerned about my own safety. I was concerned about the safety more yeah. of those who are with uh, running me. preteen camps. I know is the same thing. It was so humbling to realize. If any of these kids go in into the woods and come back with a mouthful of uh, poison ivy, yes. that's on me. You yep. know, that was my job to prevent yep. that from happening. With, with this, you mentioned earlier the day of the Lord and eclipses. It's hard not to think of when he's talking about the sun, you know, only one third, you know, shining, et cetera. That part of this is me speculatively, but I think part of what's awesome about those days to come is that there won't be easy explanations. I mean, we we are not as awed in many ways by an eclipse as the way some ancient men might have been uh, because we, we can predict it. We know the next one in the U.S. is going to be in 2044, and we know it's the moon. We know all these, all these details. At the same time, you go back to the crucifixion when it grew dark as night. Mm-hmm. That was not an eclipse. People nope. try to say it's an eclipse. No, the moon was on the r- other side of the sky. Right. That's the time of a full moon. It's just a fact that a full moon cannot be a, a, a daytime uh, exactly. eclipse. Exactly. Yeah. And so when when you're looking at the day of the Lord, it's easy for people to want to go, "Oh, well, maybe that's maybe the the moon is red because of an eclipse or maybe it's like I the the uh, what the sense I get from the passages there are that no one's going to have a good explanation other than God is moving in the world. And when you, when the sun darkens and you have no explanation, uh, when the moon is like blood and you have no explanation, and then it's kind of like a, we were joking, who is it, me and Jonathan? I can't recall. Maybe it was me and Michael. We were talking about what would Google searches be like during the day of the Lord? Like someone searching, uh, why is there blood coming out of my faucet? You know, all mm-hmm. these things. There's going to be so much going on that you, you will, you'll be forced to recognize there is a God who is in yes. charge yep. and you are, you will be reminded you're in charge of nothing. You can't just go into the house and get away from the storm. Look, uh, you'll be surrounded by things. If we as a civilization all cooperated and we wanted to, to bring to bear all of our technological knowledge and all our resources, could we bring about an eclipse? Uh, we could not, we couldn't do it. We could not put the moon and the sun there. God had to do all of that. Uh, it's a good reminder of how powerless we are and how powerful yeah. he is. I mean, what would it, how much engineering would have to go into just gently changing the, the orbit of the moon in any way? Let's say you, you generously mentioned 500 years a little while ago. I would probably say more like 5,000. I mean, you got Genesis says whatever man seeks to do would not be withheld from, but that doesn't mean it happens in one generation. Mm-hmm. I think you're looking at a you know, millennia in the future, which we would not survive to. No. Yep. Not, no, right. Not that, happen. That's the even better point. All the, all these things we want to accomplish. Well, we would never get there because we would destroy ourselves first. In fact, I think we're doing a pretty good job moving along on that track right now. <laughs> so you were, you felt a proper awe and reverence at witnessing this total blackout because you were in the right place. Um, eclipse. What, Let's talk a little about the, the, the physics behind that and the probability of these things. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, I mean, what's the probability that the sun is at this ideal distance already just for the planet and that we have this moon orbiting us and that when they overlap each other under just the right conditions, they're exactly the same size? Well, you know, I actually thought about trying to calculate the probability and that's, that's really difficult. There's so many assumptions you have to put into things. I, I will say that it doesn't have to be that way to be sure it's there's nothing that there's nothing in the laws of physics or for that matter uh, you know when it comes to astronomical phenomenon or or when it comes to biology there's nothing that requires any eclipses such that the sun and moon should correspond so precisely as that and that was you know for talking about lessons from the eclipse one of the second things that i would highlight is more than just the and not just more it's not the right word in addition to the awe of such a spectacle in the sky the signs and wonders you we have the opportunity to observe But it was also kind of a reminder that there is an orderly world behind everything we see. There's a a beautiful clockwork. There's an organization and there are laws. It's, boy, kind of hard to say. But yeah, it's a reminder that we're in a truly 
designed world that is following these laws. Even the mere fact that we could, we knew when this was going to happen. I had a countdown on my computer for the city in which we were viewing, and it's counting down to the second, you know, when you're about to see this thing. And it's as if, you know, go figure, we, uh, this is going to sound dumb, but we see the sun and the moon all the time, right? Well, at least half a day each time. But you got the moon out there and you got the sun, and they're always doing their thing, and they're orderly. And yes, you know they're orderly, and you and and you and you're grateful to God that oh, thank you for such a well-designed world. But then a moment like this reminds you of just how orderly this world is. That God really has put these mechanisms in place where we're at, we're truly living in this uh, this tuned world. Uh, Jeremiah 33 says that God appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth. And it's like, uh, this is not a great analogy or metaphor or whatever it might be, but forgive me, it's the only one I have right now. But I keep thinking it's kind of like if we lived on some big clock or something and you saw a minute hand and a second hand and an hour hand and they're and they're moving through this face and you don't really know what a clock is. You don't and you have these numbers, right? There's this one number at the top that seems larger than the others. I don't know if 12 looks bigger than 10, but just go that. And, and the, the hands often line up here and there, right? Like the second hand and the minute hand or the minute hand and the hour hand. And you're just going through life. And then you start to see this moment about to come together where even though they're all moving at different rates, the minute hand, the hour hand, and the second hand look as though maybe they're going to meet all together. And not only do they do that, but they do it at the very moment they're pointing at the top of the circle, at this one number at the top. And it's almost like even if you didn't know what a clock was, you'd, you'd, you'd think, wow, something's behind this, mm-hmm. you know, something right. has, has done that. And I feel like we, we need to be reminded every once in a while that, cause we can take it for granted. It's kind of like we drive cars everywhere, but we don't think about just how much engineering and design goes into putting an engine together like that. And the, yep. the minute firing, I mean, you only know it when something goes wrong, right? And your, your spark plugs are not quite firing exactly when they're supposed to. And you know, a light comes on or something. But when it's all going smoothly, that's the thing is you don't notice it, but it takes an amazing amount of engineering to do that. Mm-hmm. And in particular, I, I'll, I've, I'd heard of it before, but I, I want to give Mr. Ames credit because I don't know that I paid it as much attention to it until he brought it up many years ago, I think at a Charlotte uh, Bible study. In fact, I wasn't even living here yet. I was visiting here. But this uh, approach to the idea of fine tuning. We talk about fine tuning. We've written about it in the magazine that one of the evidences of God's existence is how finely tuned our universe is for life. Well, there's an additional element to that, that these fellows, I wrote their names down because I knew I wouldn't remember them. Uh, Guillermo Gonzalez, he's an astronomer and as well as an apologist and philosopher, Jay Richards, they put together this kind of hypothesis, uh, this privileged planet hypothesis which goes to highlight that not only does our, does our life here on planet Earth seem to be blessed in the sense that the universe is finely tuned to allow it to exist, mm-hmm. but more than that, it's finely tuned to allow scientific discovery. As in, you, you could live and exist, but yet, for instance, we, we are in a place in the Milky Way that if Earth had not been, if, this, if the solar system had not been in its particular place when it comes to how the, the spiral arms of the Milky Way are put out, we wouldn't be able to see as much of the sky as we do. And yet we have this beautiful open space to us that the majority of spaces inside the galaxy would not be able to see. Eclipses teach us things because they're so precise. Like even this last one, I I think I mentioned earlier in the podcast, I'm not sure, but unlike in 2017, we saw solar prominences. My, uh, uh, these, these arcs, these filaments of the sun's uh, plasma that shoot off from the surface because the, the sun was covered so precisely 
that here you have this phenomenon on the surface that we were literally able to detect with our naked eyes and you could see these things. Whereas if the moon had been a whole lot larger or for that matter, a lot smaller, you wouldn't have seen any of that. You, you have these, these facts in our universe that clearly show a mind has put all of this together. And in that moment, looking at the, the sun and moon in that kind of conjunction here with the earth where we were, it, you're just, at least I was, just overwhelmed with the sense that we have the privilege of living inside a masterpiece that has had a, a master engineer and designer work and, and put together. Okay, so I have a small clarification point. Sure. That I thought maybe you could, because I'm just thinking about teenage John Robinson, <laughs> and I, I would not really have a good sense of what that means, appointed the ordinances of the heaven and the earth. Mm, like what okay. is, what is, can, maybe you could do it in other words, what, is, what is that meaning? Like, well, what is an ordinance? Ah, okay. Well, good question. I, I tend to not be as persnickety about some of these words as others might be. I'm not saying that's bad for them to be. I just find that I, I operate in the level that that makes sense and is still accurate. I don't I don't need to be more accurate. Uh, you know, ordinances are like regulations and rules and laws. Mm -hmm. And in the sense that you have heaven and earth, we do live in an orderly heaven and earth that. Uh, gravity keeps the planets where they are behaving the way they do. The fact that we were able to predict that mankind, not only the one this year, but the one in 2044, we know exactly when that eclipse is going to happen. We know exactly where it's going to be visible, what the boundaries of the shadow will be. Why is that? Because we live in this amazingly ordered universe and what Jeremiah 33, it's verse 25, where it says that, is that why do we do that? Because God has appointed those mm -hmm. laws. God, you know, it's, it's amazing to me that we can sit down, you and I right now could actually write out a lot of the, uh, the laws of the universe. I could sit down with you. We could write the law of gravitation. We actually watched a video on that just yesterday because it's related to flat earth again. Some people say that you know, you, well, you just don't see gravity. How can you test for it? Well, actually you can do gravity, not up and down. They, they've measured gravity sideways, right? Parallel to the earth. You know, and you find you get the same factor as you would if you were measuring up and down, but because all mass has a certain amount of, it, it, it generates, if you will, a certain amount of gravity, you know, things, massive things attract each other. Well, we could write down that law. Uh, force equals big G. It's a factor that you have to calculate. You have to measure from, from the effect uh, times the product of the two masses divided by the distance between them mm -hmm. squared. It's this beautifully simple law that we could literally write on a piece of paper. And that law as best we can tell is true everywhere in the universe. Right. I mean, we see right. that law everywhere and why is that? Why, why should multiplication of two numbers, right? Which we think of numbers, what are, what are they even, right? Why should squaring the distance, exactly squaring the distance work in all of this? And what, how can we do that? Well, the Bible says that God appointed those laws, that God has ordered and structured this universe in the same way that we have commandments that you know it's a sin to commit adultery. It's a sin to murder. God has also ordered the universe, the difference being the universe actually does everything that he tells it to do. It's only humans that decide we're going to do something else. And so that's what I mean, that God appointed yeah. these laws and these ordinances. So would it, would it be fair to characterize it as kind of saying that, that God established the laws that, that govern the physics around us? Sure. Yeah. I would you know, say. So, so why do that heaven and the that. earth perform in a predictable way? Because God established those rules, boundaries, laws, physics, whatever you want to call it, that make them work very predictably. You know, one of the things I, I struggled with for a while understanding, but um, so I was watching this thing um, talking about discoveries we've made in the last, you know, 20, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And one of them is Gobekli Tepe, which mm. is now, you know, one of the oldest things we think that we've ever found on the earth. Right. Now that's a, a kind of a area in Turkey. Yeah, is that in, where it is? Yeah, it's in Turkey. It's an ancient, it's ancient. a big mound they found that's, that's more sophisticated than they expected it to be. But here's my, my point. I didn't understand this. Um, they think they found a stone that had possibly some of the, um, 
constellations depicted on it. And what I was blown away by was that if we if we want to know what the constellations look like a thousand years ago, we can do it. Like that you, I'm not going to pretend like I understand how that works, but, but the physics governing the constellations and how every, how the earth moves and spins and, 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 and then even the, I think the Milky Way is moving around as well, isn't it? Yeah. Everything's moving. In fact, uh, that's, you know, the idea that it's just a fixed dome over our head. Mm -hmm. Some people say the Bible has to say that that is not what firm room. It means it does not have to be that. And uh, yeah, there are some stars. I think Bernard star is a, I don't think it's Betelgeuse. I think it's Bernard. I think it's Bernard star. It, it, it's moving fast enough that over the years we've been able to, to track it in the heavens. Right. You can actually look at old photos and compare them and we, and we see a certain velocity. And so from that, yeah, that we can put all these things together and, and understand what's the configuration going to be mm-hmm. a thousand years from now, you know, 20,000 years, if God doesn't change everything, of course. Well, you, you know, if you think that the, the pyramids were 4,000 years ago or whatever. Well, if you want to know what stars they would have been in alignment with 4,000 years ago, you can go back and figure that out. Like, right. You know, if you, exactly. If you built a model. That's kind of my point. Like, yeah. That's yeah. How, that's how we keep time basically. Right. Exactly. Right. Okay. That was pretty good. The privilege. I'm glad you mentioned the privileged planet. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting. I don't get into it as much as you do, but I've heard that to me, that was one of the, um, one of the things that resonated with me was, Man, you just move a few details of physics about the Earth and its position just a little, one way or the other. All of a sudden, we don't have such a great, uh, <laughs> little, you know, just just the right distance from the sun and various yeah. things like that. A little closer and more like more like Mercury and a little further away and it's chillier. Right, and that's and that's part of what I think is all the more interesting about uh, uh, Guillermo. Uh, I say his first name like I know him, uh, Mr. Gonzalez and Mr. Richards and their argument is that it's more than just, we wouldn't, you know, we need all these things to survive. These things actually enable us to learn about the universe. And I think that's more fascinating because you could imagine a people being able to live on a planet, but not being able to discover that much mm-hmm. about it versus all these things that like, if you were on Mars, you wouldn't have eclipses like we do. I mean, you, your, your little moon things, which aren't much on Mars, they go, they do go in front of the sun, man, not like ours. I mean, mm. it's, it's just an amazing that how it's capable of fitting so precisely. So there's, there's the fact that you've, you nudge things a little bit and we wouldn't be able to survive, but all the more you nudge them a little bit and we wouldn't be able to, to, to have learned and gained such knowledge. Like God specifically says in scripture that the heavens declare his glory. Well, we could be in certain places in the galaxy and we wouldn't even have the same recognition of the heavens, but we just happen to be in a place where we see vast amounts of the heavens and all the more it adds to mm-hmm. his glory in that way. Yeah, no, that's amazing. Okay. You said earlier that when you went out and witnessed with appropriate reverence and awe, this eclipse, at least hopefully appropriate, yeah. there definitely was some, yeah, uh, that, that you were traveling with, um, family really at this point now because yeah. of the, the marriage of your kids. Yeah, I guess so. What was it? T- talk a little bit about, cause you, you know, I know the point that you're going to make here, of course, I'm not trying to pretend otherwise, but talk, <laughs> talk a little bit about what the experience lot was. Cause, cause this really resonated with me. I, I am definitely, I would not be an alone guy. Mm-hmm. Like I, I, you can leave me alone for short periods of time and that's fine. But after like a day or two, Hey, you know, I, you know, if my wife was out of town or something like that and, and I would want, you know, the, in short order, I would want somebody around me to share my life experiences with. Hmm. What was it like going and witnessing this, but but with your 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 immediate family and then your extended family through marriage? Well, thanks. Uh, yeah, that was the third point that I wanted to talk about. Was I, I'm not I'm not against uh, solitary experiences to be sure. You know, there's there's things that I find fascinating that nobody else does, right? And our book I'm reading, I, it's it's hard to read all the time with 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 other people reading aloud, I suppose, but definitely this is a good example. This was a good example of an experience that was enhanced because we were enjoying it with, with friends and loved ones. It was our family. So, uh, everyone, but David, my son, David, who did get to see the 2017 eclipse. So he has seen a a total eclipse. Don't like your, all your boys seeing the same. eclipse. Apparently, apparently not. So he was with the LA kids. They were, they were on a, a really cool hiking trip. So you had, a. Uh, my wife and myself, and then you had three of our sons. They were able to, to synchronize their vacation time so they could pull this off. 
then you had the De Simone, not the not all again, not all of the De Simones, but different responsibilities. But we had Mr. De Simone and Mrs. De Simone. We had uh, the the Brian and Stephanie Falls children with us, which was wonderful. Boy, they just hey, for the record out there, for those who don't know who Mr. Fall is, uh, Mr. Brian Fall, he writes some of our works of his hands articles. You mm-hmm. see his work in the magazine. So we stayed. They they were kind enough to house us. And uh, give us a place to, to lay our head and enjoy a wonderful fellowship. But we brought their kids along, so they, they got to see it and uh, enjoy spending time there with, uh, with them. And so we're all experiencing this, and it clearly was a richer and fuller experience, not just because we could talk about it, and we can actually interact about it, and, and someone might notice something you didn't notice or or... It was, and not just because someone else is expressing joy and you're hearing it, it's enhancing your, all of that is a part of it for sure. But I would even dare say just merely knowing that someone you care about is enjoying it with you, even if you were in there in silence watching it, right? It, it enhances that experience. It, it caused me to think of a few things. And I, I know I, I had several verses. I was trying to find uh, one that would really land on it. Uh, one of the, the one of the passages I want to, our principles I won't necessarily go to the verse but Paul talks about this in in First Corinthians, but the fact that God designed the church for instance to be a body of mm-hmm. people He never designed it to be just one guy in his living room right. or or even just one small family in their living room. Now we understand there's pressing circumstances at times when people might be alone, but in terms of the way God wants things to work most of the time, the healthiest condition is always a part of a body. And he talks about how we share each other's burdens, but he also talks in first Corinthians, how we share each other's joys. Well, that there, he seems to be emphasizing, trying to encourage the brethren in Corinth to be more unified, to really look to each other as a body. But I would dare say it's, 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 it's more than that. It's not just, Hey, we all share each other's this. So, so get your act together. But it's also, well, why do we share each other's joy? Yep. And, and the verse, that, it might seem an odd one, but the verse that came to mind was in Ecclesiastes. There's this verse in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 4 and verse 9, where Solomon writes, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Now, he goes on to talk about how uh, there's benefits to that. Like if one person falls, the other person can pick them up. If, if, you know, if, if they lie down in the cold, you know, two people can stay warm better. If one's overpowered, then two. And so it, it, there's the obvious benefits. But still, when he says two are better than one because they have g- a good reward for their labor, I, the, I think the New International Version says a good return for their labor. But, you know, it's reward sometimes we, we think of a little bit differently. I take that, it make, it causes me to think rather, times when I've worked with other people, I'd say working with you, Mr. Robinson, it's such a privilege to get to work with you as closely as I get to on a, on a daily basis. I would dare say that, you know, I, I accomplish things I have to do and by myself, I could, I could do things. And by yourself, you know, you mm-hmm. could do things. But I like to think that if I just make up numbers for the sake of goofiness, if I accomplish 10 units of things and you accomplish 10 units of things, mm-hmm. if we were off by ourselves, but together, I think we accomplish more than 20 units of things. I think it's more than just 10 plus 10. I think there is a, a kind of a multiplying factor yeah. that really, I mean, think about it. You could take all the individual people who, who say build a space shuttle individually all together, they can accomplish wonderful things, but the only way a space shuttle can really come together is if all of those people are working, are working together and there's kind of a multiplying effect. Well, at least my speculation I would say, and I think this was highlighted by this experience is I think that goes for, for joy as well. There's something, there's one thing, I mean, okay, let me, let me presume this, Mr. Robinson, you can elaborate in a way that I, I can't because even though I've been in such circumstances, they don't mean the same thing. Okay. I have one memory I could share, but I'll defer to you. You can watch a sports game and something amazing happened, like a Hail uh, Mary, Hail Mary, we're not Catholics, but that's what they call it in football often, a Hail Mary throw, where it's this desperate throw, right? And it just happens to be caught by your team. And there's a, and even if I were seeing that alone, I would be pumped. I mean, that would be amazing to see. 
but it's not the same thing as being in a room full of your friends all yep. rooting for the same team, yep. right? It, yep. it is it is more joyful. Well, there's, there's science behind that in some ways, and this, this may sound a little odd, but I just listened to a podcast in the last month that <laughs> the, the irony was um, the biology is, if, if all things being equal, that women are actually more predictable than men. We are influenced by external things. So if I, if, if here's, I'll give you several examples. If a man actually just looks at a gun, his testosterone level goes up. If your sports team wins, your testosterone level goes up. If you're on a sports team that won, even if you're not the hero, there's another hero that, that succeeded for the team, your testosterone levels go up. <laughs> That's pretty, so, pretty sensitive to yeah. the environment. So, so, so men actually in, in, in one regard, but that's just only one metric, right? Because there's other metrics that govern how, how our, our behavior manifests itself. And, then, and just in this one, it's our testosterone, level, testosterone levels vary based on external persona that we are external um stimuli stimuli thank you that we we are not in control of i i do know in this case and i you know what i did i looked up that other verse and i'm going to read it because i think it's actually kind of a neat one it's in proverbs 27 and verse 9 where it says ointment and perfume delight the heart and the sweetness of a man's friend gives delight by hearty counsel yeah that's good yeah and i and i like that in the sense that it it's it's not just speaking about, it's not quite the same flavor as those verses that say, oh, you know, there's safety in, in counsel with, you know, different numbers of people. It's good to get counsel. But this idea of the, of the sweetness of your friend, it's hearty counsel and discussion. And there is a, a real joy in discussing things with others. So I would say in this particular circumstance, it was not only great to talk about it and to experiencing it together, but it, I mean, sorry, to talk about the experience. Uh, and some people even notice things you didn't notice, right? And it's kind of fun when someone sees the red dots and they say that, oh, what's that red dot? Oh, I don't know. But even the mere fact of knowing that I'm, I was sharing this experience with people I care profoundly about was moving. And it made me think, too, of the opposite, which is what our society seems to concentrate on. I know we're coming to a close, but I want to make sure I get this out there. And I, this is me examining my here. Passover's coming up, examining myself, my own tendencies, I contrast that experience with what our society is increasingly training us to do, which is essentially to sit in a chair and watch a YouTube video or whatever by ourselves mm -hmm. on our phones. Not even, I mean, sometimes even I mean, frequently, you know, we just put earphones in, right? So we've literally created this tiny experience for just us. And on one hand, that's not necessarily bad. If I'm watching some educational video about something that I realize my family, my wife's trying to focus on something or my son's trying to, then that can be a politeness, you know, to a certain extent is we're not forcing everyone else to listen to, to what you're doing. And yet at the same time, the, the massive availability of individualized experiences, not just entertainment, but experiences, I suspect overall that we're losing something great. I know if it had just been me experiencing that eclipse by myself, as, much, as, as amazing as it would have been, it would not have been the same. And throughout most of human history, a lot of those experiences were with other people. But now we live in a day and age where it's like it can be exactly the opposite. Most of your experiences that you're feeding yourself constantly are just you in this little imaginary yeah. room that you've created. And yeah. I, I just can't fathom that that's healthy. Well, you know, you see it all the time these days, unfortunately. If you go into a restaurant, sometimes you'll see a group of people sitting there at the table, each of them scrolling on their phones and not, not interacting with each other. I, 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 there's another podcast I've been listening to recently that's just talking talking again. Like the, the evidence is just piling up. It's kind of a combination thing, but but smartphones and social media are are – have had a very detrimental effect on us and one of them is separating and like it's 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 actually showing up in the statistics in the sense that marriages are down dating is down people don't go out and find people people you, you know it's just it's isolating 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 and the, the, did, you, did you note that for the first time ever the world population has actually dropped it has not gone up. the world population I believe that's correct we might uh. double check that so it's not fake news <laughs> but you know we were approaching eight billion people for a long time which i do think we crested over but i mean 
for a while you could actually watch the population clock and it was just, ex, you know, you could just watch it going up and you, I, I could understand why people were concerned about where we were headed with the population in some sense. Oh, but the best I can see so far is they suggested that current models have the world population peaking in 2080, but then starting to drop after uh, that. Okay. So, so that was fake news. <laughs> Well, it might have been might have been just a little twisted, but they 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 yeah suspected that it, it peak at about ten billion and then start and then start dropping. Well, there are nations that are losing population. Oh yeah, Japan's using losing quite a bit of population. Well, birth rates have have just yeah. plummeted, right? That people aren't getting together. Yeah, they're not not marrying, not making families. Mm-hmm. So anyway, that's that's all. I I have literally no more spiritual lessons from the eclipse. No, I'm just kidding. I think there's a the kind of thing that over time you meditate on and, and new things tend to tend to sink in. In fact, if any of our viewers out there happen to see the eclipse or listeners uh, happen to see the eclipse and have some spiritual thoughts of your own, by all means, feel free and share them with us. We'd, we'd love to read them. Like comment, subscribe, hit that <laughs> notification bell. No, wait, it's yeah. smash, smash that notification bell. Yeah. And I look forward to our podcast on the next American eclipse Robinson in 2044. I look forward to doing that with mm, you. We'll be old. We will be old, but hopefully old and happy. Hopefully, frankly, in the kingdom of God. May yes. the next eclipse we experience ah, what be a good in the saying. kingdom of God. Good. <laughs> Smith and Robinson.